This is an overview training video for bypass design, installation, and decommission. The objectives of this training are to become familiar with the different types of bypass systems and what considerations should be made during the development of your proposal and plans to ensure the proper protection of fish life. The following presentation will cover this order of topics. When is a bypass needed? Bypass overview, key components of a bypass, and typical construction sequencing. When projects involve excavation within an active channel or other work that may disturb sediment or harm fish, a bypass will likely be required by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Minor projects where water quality can be easily maintained or the stream channel is dry may not require a bypass. This is a plan view example of the components included in a bypass. The work site is shaded pink and is that area that we are trying to dry up for construction purposes. In this example, the stream water is being diverted around the work area in the gray colored line and dissipated immediately downstream. Block nets are installed upstream and downstream in order to prevent fish from entering the work site during construction. Next, we will go through each component so you become familiar with the different options typically used in a bypass system. The first step is typically installation of the fish block nets. Metal screen panels or mesh nets are installed upstream and downstream to form physical barriers to exclude fish out of the work area. Care must be taken to install the barriers in a manner that prevents undue risk or harm to fish. For example, screen panels placed perpendicular to swift flowing water pose an impingement risk to fish. Mesh nets are typically weighted at the bottom and need to be checked regularly to ensure that it has not been breached or compromised. The ideal exclusion barrier is located in a low velocity area so that fish may approach the net or screen and swim away from it at will. After installation of the upstream block net, it is advantageous for the contractor to walk the second net downstream through the channel and hopefully sweep most of the fish out of the work area. The next step will be to install the temporary water diversion structure. The following slides will show examples of the different types of bypasses that can be used for flow diversion. Flows can be diverted with pumps or passive systems such as side channels or culverts. The temporary bypass system must consist of non-erosive techniques, such as a pipe or a plastic line channel, both of which must be sized large enough to accommodate the predicted peak flow rate during construction. A gravity-fed bypass channel is constructed out of plastic sheeting and straw bales or sandbags along the sides. This method creates a temporary channel around the work area and the plastic prevents scouring and turbidity. Another method is a culvert gravity bypass. This method is generally preferred because you don't need to worry about pumps or maintaining pumps over a weekend or holiday. The inlet and outlet are typically sandbagged and work better if wrapped in plastic sheeting to prevent leaking. Notice the outlet has plastic at the outlet of the culvert used to prevent erosion and a cofferdam to prevent backwater of the site. Another method used to divert flow around a work area is with a pump. Pump bypasses are better for smaller streams or for short durations. For example, one to two day projects and need to be sized in order to handle all expected flows while installed. It is recommended that additional pumps are on site should one fail. Additionally, all pump intakes need to include a fish screen per Department of Fish and Wildlife screening criteria. Pumps may also be used to remove additional groundwater within the work site once the bypass is installed. This water is typically discharged upland a sufficient distance and allowed to infiltrate back to the creek. Fish screens must meet Department of Fish and Wildlife criteria for pore size and velocity in order to prevent fish from being taken into the pump or impinged on the screen. Fish screens also need to be regularly cleared of debris in order to continually meet the velocity criteria. Water discharging from the temporary bypass needs energy dissipation to prevent damage to the creek bed or banks. There are many ways to dissipate the energy. Turbid water must not be allowed to re-enter the stream or any wetlands. Here are a couple examples of energy dissipators to help prevent scour and turbidity. 
It is important to note that the outfall and energy dissipator need to be located immediately downstream of the work area so that the downstream area is not dewatered, causing a stranding issue. Even when the creek is diverted through a bypass system, some leakage may occur or groundwater may enter the work site. Silty water pumped from the isolated work zone should be discharged upland for filtration or contained in baker tanks, detention pond, or other options prior to entering the creek. Next we will take a look at a few different types of temporary dams used to block the water flow. If the site is relatively flat, the Department of Fish and Wildlife may also require a dam downstream of the work area in order to prevent any backwater from entering the site. For a standard dam, burlap bags filled with pea gravel are preferred. Gravel bag dams wrapped in plastic sheeting work very well to prevent leakage. Water-filled bladders need to be staked along the upstream side to prevent it from rolling downstream. When finished using a water-filled bladder, considerations need to be made for where the water is released in order to prevent discharge of contaminated or high temperature water. Super sacks are typically installed with a crane or excavator and should be filled with rounded gravel in case of spillage. Culvert plugs fill with air and only work with round culverts, but can be a quick way to block water at a culvert site. Construction of the cofferdam should be done in stages to allow a gradual downramping of the flow so that fish can be relocated safely. As cofferdams are put in place, fish salvage and release activities can continue during the slow drawdown of water. Any fish capture should be in accordance with National Marine Fishery Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recommended guidelines for dewatering, fish capture, and fish relocation in areas where ESA listed fish species may be present. Fish should be relocated from the work area using dip nets, electroshocking, or seine nets to free flowing water. Relocation should also comply with NOAA Fisheries Backpack Electrofishing Guidelines when using backpack electrofishing equipment for fish removal. Contractors should continue to electrofish, seine, and or dip net until no fish are caught for three consecutive passes. Putting all the components together, the following is a typical sequencing. The process begins with placing block nets upstream and downstream of the project area. Biologists can then capture and safely relocate fish trapped in the work zone. Oftentimes, walking the second block net downstream through the channel can herd the fish out of the work zone. Next, the water diversion system is set in place via a bypass pipe or plastic line channel is installed. A temporary cofferdam is slowly built upstream of the work area and the stream is diverted through the bypass. A temporary cofferdam is then built at the downstream end to isolate the work area completely and prevent backwater. The final pass through the work area is made to remove any remaining fish. Water may need to be pumped out of the isolated project area and should be routed to a temporary storage and treatment site or into upland areas and allowed to filter through vegetation prior to re-entering the stream channel. Upon completion of the project, all material used in the temporary bypass needs to be removed from the site and the site returned to pre-project or improved conditions. Any damaged stream banks should be restored to a natural slope and profile suitable for establishment of permanent woody vegetation. Keep the following key points in mind in order to minimize the impact of fish and habitat. The bypass design should be developed by the project engineer who has studied the basin hydrology and can design the bypass system for all potential stream flows at the time of construction. The bypass design must maintain structural integrity for all expected flows and pass large woody material and sediment. Early coordination with the Department of Fish and Wildlife on this aspect is key to achieving a good bypass plan. Another key point to consider is maintaining water quality. All work operations should be conducted in such a manner that causes little or no siltation to adjacent areas. The bypass should be designed and installed in order to achieve this goal. Disturbance of the bank and bank vegetation should be limited to that necessary to construct the project. The next two slides are examples of bypass plans. The bypass system should have the capacity to handle the two-year peak flow or greater. If the system will be in place over winter, the system will likely need to be fish passable and be able to pass all expected flows over winter. 
This example shows the pumped water discharging into a straw bale infiltration site prior to returning to the creek. Your hydraulic project approval will include provisions required for the bypass. A Department of Fish and Wildlife biologist may conduct a compliance check of your bypass. The compliance check will include making sure the block nets and dams are well above the elevation of the ordinary high water line so that the work area can be adequately isolated even during unexpected high water events. The biologist will check to make sure the block nets are functioning properly. Debris must be removed from barriers regularly to prevent water from going over or around the barrier and to prevent impingement of fish. Contractors should plan to have additional pumps and equipment on hand because they can often fail during unexpected high flow events. This will be a time consuming problem because if there is a breach of water into the work zone, the site will need to be swept for fish again prior to restarting work. Department of Fish and Wildlife habitat biologists are available to assist you in developing your bypass plan and addressing issues that arise during construction. To find the habitat biologist assigned to your area, visit our website at wdfw.wa.gov forward slash conservation forward slash habitat. We hope that this training video provides significant assistance in your bypass planning and that you have a great project.